Hi, Vinny. How are you? Hello, Andrew. Nice to see you. Good. I'm fine. How are you? You know what? It's Tuesday morning here in Brisbane, Australia. I have no complaints about life. (laughs) That's great to hear. That's really good to hear. It's wonderful to hear your voice. Perfect perfect thinking along my lines, you know? I've got no no complaints. My dogs are happy. I'm happy. My music is happy. You know, so life is good. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I get to sing along, and I'm up, you know. I, I plug in my guitar right around 9 a.m. after I feed them. You know, I, I turn up, I get everything cranked, and I play for about four hours, and I feed them again. Then I go into my studio, start making music, and there you go. So where should we start, my friend? I'll let you start the interview. I I will say this. Uh, yep. I don't speak of, I don't include interviews that, uh, I, I should put it this way. Um, I don't promote anyone. Those days are gone. That's fine. So if we're bringing up past affiliations, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't go there anymore. So, and, uh, if you know what I mean, yeah. we just kind of no names are mentioned because it's it's really not of importance anymore. Uh, unless it's, it has to do with Kiss, which I understand, but anything from there, uh, you know, I prefer us just moving along without names. You know, I get mixed interviews, and uh, some of it is tell us about, you know, they, they go back. And I understand the need to do that. So um, those days were promoting people that I didn't see the talent there to promote. And uh, there was only one person that I believed in that, that really had a God's gift. And uh, that was Rob, Robert Fleischman. But from there, it was, you know, I've, I've got a long coat and people are holding on to those coattails and I had to wonder why and, and realize they're, you know, they benefited more than I did. You know, so the, the equation was one-sided as far as who benefited the most. But we'll pass that. We'll move on to the future, and I like where you're going. So I'm all yours. I'm wherever you want to take this. I'm, I am. I will follow. Well, well, I read today that you've got some re-releases coming out. So tell me all about them. self-explanatory. The re-releases are things that uh, I had recorded 20 years ago. And it's, it's ironic that, uh, you know, I, that they would be in, you know, in, in, that they would be desired. You know, there's, there's a lot of money being paid for these, you know, originals. And there's a, there's a desire for them, which really has, uh, I guess it has been more important to me than, you know, just just in general. It's been the, the, the fact that they've been desired is the is the real reason to say, well, you know, why not? Why not let everyone enjoy them uh, for for you know is you know the, the accessibility to have them? So why not? So I'm re-releasing Speedball Jam. Which, uh, and I'm re-releasing Euphoria, and the big one is the Guitar Mageddon album that had actually never been released. So, you know, I'm excited in, in about all three of them in a way that uh, allows me to recreate, uh, well, actually allows me to design and create a collector's edition, which is, um, you know, we're not doing the jewel case, we're, you know, it's going to be more of a, like an album cover, you know, CD, and we're going to release it on pink vinyl, which would, you know, with new artwork, new photos, a lot more, you know, uh, liner notes, a lot more of my background story on each of the CDs and, the, you know, each of the songs and how it came to pass. Now, Euphoria CD were, that was, those four songs on there were 
different demos. And uh, they were demos with, uh, you know, it, it was interesting because it was, you know, they, they existed in master form, but they were actually re, re, rearranged and, you know, there were new ideas that were happening from the 80s into 96. But by the time I recorded that in 96, it was still in a demo form of, okay, this is now the arrangement of these songs. This is where I hear them. And let me just, you know, get an, over, get an overall, you know, picture of what each song should be. And I had them as demos. And I remember being called to Europe to do a KISS convention and someone said, just bring over what you have, you know? And I said, well, look, you know, I don't want to bring over the master recordings because they're not mixed. And I said, but I just cut these uh, four demos from from Guitar Armageddon, but you know, they're just in demo form. Eh, bring it, you know, just press it and bring it. And that's what I did. So, uh, the 20 year gap in all of that, this last 20 years had been unable, I had been unable to take it any farther, but now I will be. So I'll be re releasing the Euphoria CD with, you know, new liner notes, a back, a back story of each of the songs, new photographs, you know, it'll be something that, that will be a collector's item. And then uh, we'll be releasing it on Pink Final. And, you know, with the same, the same packaging. The same with Speedball Jam, which I think, I did Speedball Jam as a, as an experiment. It was actually for myself, I, you know, it, it, it's, it's a really self-indulgent CD and it's hard to listen to. Even if you're a guitarist, it's hard to listen to because it's, it's really an intense piece that centers around one jam that Vinnie Vincent Invasion used to, uh, used to jam at rehearsals on. And uh, there, there were no breaks in, there were no tracks to, to stop the recording in any of it. So I just said, let the recording go. So it's an hour of very intense jamming. And uh, it, it, to me, it's, it, it's an interesting timepiece and it's meant to be a historical recording more than anything else. So it's just a shredding uh, piece from beginning to end. And, you know, and, and it wasn't meant to be anything more than that other than to capture a moment in time uh, in 1986 at private rehearsal sessions. And I thought, I'm gonna do this just for the hell of it. It's, it's too unusual. You know, if someone enjoys it fine, but it's more of a history piece than, than you know, this is not a lot of songs put together. This isn't anything more than, you know, plug in, you know, come up with a riff, jam on it until until the tape runs out. So it was really more or less of something like that. Guitar Armageddon is my baby because this has been in the Vinnie vault, you know, for a long time. And I'm the only one that has the master recordings, the master mixes. And this is, you know, something I was saving for the Vinnie Vincent archives. And that that's a whole nother, you know, whole nother subject. But I said, you know, what? Why save it just for that? Let the fans enjoy it because there's so much to enjoy here. And I was assembling the the archives, you know, about two months ago, and then we got kind of caught in the whirlwind of a lot of shows and getting ready for this and that. And I started listening to them. Even at a low level, you know, low, low volume level, there was so much power there. And they said, geez, you know, the fans really should, should hear this because I'm, I'm enjoying it, you know? And it was, it was pretty well the natural progression of the first Vinnie Vincent Invasion album. So um, I said, what, what, let's have the fans hear it. It has... There's so much to enjoy here, lyrically, musically. The songs, I think, really stand out. There's a lot of playing involved, and uh, 
you know, it's a, it's a three-piece record with, oh, it's over the top. I mean, it's, 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 like I said, it's the extension of the Vinnie Vincent Invasion first album. Completely over the top stuff. And uh, it, was, it was, more importantly to me, it was a place where I felt, you know, I had advanced as a guitarist into a place that I felt you know, I've finally found my plateau, you know? So, uh, these are the three things that are going to be out by the end of summer. And I'll be making a lot of announcements on them. And, you know, as they start to materialize, you know, there'll be, you know, the artwork will be coming and things like that. But I'll be updating everything uh, as they come. Now, we have... Uh, May is filled with uh, shows, but when we get back, we're going to be going into the studio to, to do a lot of finishing touches on this. Funny enough that we're talking uh, because I, at the moment, am scheduled for an Australian tour in August, at the end of July, I, I think it's July and it, it, it going into August, or it's just in August. Um, so it's, I may see you down there because we're working out the details now with the promoter. And you mentioned actually before that you head down into your studio every day. So w what sort of new music are you recording? Do you have sort of modern influences that you're drawing from or is, you know, Where's Vinny's head at? I have the same Vinny that I draw from because it's, it's all based in pain one way or another, you know, because there's nothing really based anywhere, but, you know, this is what I do. You know, I, you know, for, it's a range of emotions. It's, you know, so when I put on a, you know, when I pick up my electric, you know, it's a certain thing that comes out, you know, so, you know, it, it's, this is what I do. So it's, the songs are, they, they, you know, they're, they're written along the lines of this is what I do. Now, I try to make, make it all, it, I try to advance everything because, you know, music is about, or at least writing is about, uh, you know, wherever you are in your life at a certain point. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a big book here of, you know, Vinny, the Vinny world and the experiences and everything that's happened. It's a, it's a very big book. So the music goes with that book, you know, so it's the, the music book. So whether it's pain from a melodic level or it's, you know, energy-based it's, it's still coming from the same source, you know, wherever that heart beats at that moment. So, um, you know, the, 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 you know the, these, I've got three albums of material that I've been reviewing, you know, just to see, do, how does this hold up to me? You know, do I like this? You know, is it something I would want to listen to? You know, these are the questions I ask myself. So, you know, when you're dealing with three albums, you're talking 30 songs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they were written during the last 20 years. But it was my way to survive a lot of the things I was going through. And, uh, you know, the guitar saved me because that was all that I had to get me through, you know, an insane time. You know, it was the only thing I had to hold on to sanity. So, you know, where, where lyrically I was at, um, you know, from looking at rock, rock and roll life from, from a different perspective than I looked at it from the 80s. Yep. Was very, very different, you know? And in the 1980s, life was this way. The 1990s, you know, it all changed, but, you know, I brought my own changes into my own lyrics. <clears throat> so, you know, musically, I was stretching the limits, and, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't want to feel like uh, there were there were boundaries for me, so, 
the one thing I, I, and I had an interview with someone today and he says, well, we're looking forward to new music and new this and new that, but, and I told him, I said, look, the reality of what we're looking at is everybody that I talk to says, we want a new album. We want new music. And I think, you know, sure. <laughs> so do I, you know, I said, I've, I've been wanting to put new music out for a long time, but three things have changed since the 1980s and 1990s into the 2000s. Um, record companies are, they're merging. There are very few left. You know, they look for like the new kind of thing, you know, that the, the new thing of today, which is not something I do. And, you know, records are, are no more. So there's like a new, a new, you know, genre of internet downloads. And CDs are, you know, unless they're collector CDs, that's changed. So it's iTunes and things like that, which is fine. But the thing that's changed the most is whatever way you look at it, people like me, people who do what I do, um, have to record in a, in a studio. You know, it's not something you can do uh, you know, in, in demo stuff, you, you've got to, you, you have to have studio work. You have to have, you know, studios that are most likely going to run you about a hundred grand per record to put out. Why? Because it's very time consuming. You pay by the day or by the month. And the way I work, you know, I want to be sure. So, you know, these things, they just, the, the, the cost of, of putting albums out are very expensive. So that's, that's the thing that's still the same, the same impediment that you had in the 80s and you had through some of the 90s disappeared in the 2000s and, and, and forward. The same impediment you have for hard rock is recording time cost of recording, the cost of doing a record, that actually has never changed. So when people say they want new music, I think, you know, so do I, you know, I want to be able to get it out. So these are, these are the obstacles, but I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to overcome them and, at some point and start to put the new stuff out. I'm not sure how it's going to happen, but... You know, where there's a will, you know, some, some of this, you know, it has a life of its own. It's going to find, it's going to find the birth, birthing, and it's go, going to find, you know, maturity, and it's going to find its way onto, you know, onto a disc one way or another. So these are the things I want to see happen that I'm hoping will happen and that, uh, you know, I'm crossing my fingers because I want to bring this music to people, you know, to the fans that are that are there. It, it deserves to be there. Living in Nashville, like, that's got to be a massive hotbed for great musicians. Over your time in Nashville, have you actually collaborated with people we may not have known about? I don't. I don't. I don't. It's, it's funny that, you know, it, it's... I'm actually completely out of touch with with players and, and the, the music scene that, that is here. And it, there's quite a big music scene. But I, I will tell you something phenomenal that happened to me uh, back in 90, 95 or 96. And that, I, I dropped off the earth right there when I, I did a KISS convention, a KISS expo tour in 96 for a few weeks in Europe and it was a it was a, a bloody disaster the the uh, promoter in Sweden was wonderful I spent a week in Sweden we had a successful expo and then changed promoters and then started a, a kiss expo throughout Europe and it was it was just beyond a nightmare you know it was it was it was so hideous that i kept giving them warnings written warnings either you pull this together you make this a safe tour 
you know, you make this work for me. You put me in hotels that are not cockroach, you know, infested rooms, or I'm walking. So, <laughs> needless to say, he he put me last on his list of things that he, you know, needed to accomplish, and I decided to leave. So, um, uh, let's see, where was I? <laughs> I think I got sidetracked there. Oh, so uh, at the time, though, before I had left for for that KISS Expo, I had been new to Nashville only a few years, and uh, I said, gee, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, country greats that I grew up listening to, and, and were heroes to me because, you know, I grew up in, in a, you know, my childhood was exposed to country music because my dad played steel guitar, my mom sang, we had, you know, really phenomenal musicians over, you know, who practiced three times a week in, in the apartment we lived in. But those were the 50s, and then, you know, they were, you know, I was exposed to music at a really young age, so I could never go to sleep. I'd sit there and listen to, to them rehearse until 10 or 11, to sit up with them while I have coffee. And uh, that was that was how I, you know, how it all began for me. But, so, you know, my my early heroes actually into my into my adult life was you know Chet Atkins. So Chet was the um, you know he was what I patterned my my playing uh, after you know over a period of time. So I said, oh you know I think let me give let me call some of these greats to see you know if I could just say I'll stop by and say hello. So I remember calling Chet and and. I, I thought I had a number for him. I wasn't sure what it was, you know, I wasn't sure I had it, but I called. And, and it was, a, it was a, you know, a lifetime experience all in a moment. Because I, I said uh, a very friendly, you know, uh, I guess assistant or secretary answered the phone and I said, can I help you? And I said, this is Vinnie Vincent. I just wanted to, you know, I moved to Nashville and I wanted to say hi to Chet. He says, can you hold on, please? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'll hold on. So the next thing I hear is, Vinny, this is Chet. I'm <laughs> thinking, oh, my God. Wow. You know, it was like hearing Paul McCartney say, Vinny, this is Paul McCartney. You know, for me, these are my... You know, I could drop dead on a dime from a heart attack and, you know, hearing somebody say, Vinny, this is Chet Atkins. But he didn't say, he didn't say his last name. He said, Vinny, this is Chet. And I just, you know, shit a brick. <laughs> so uh, he said, are you doing anything right now? I said, am I doing anything? I said, yeah, I'm basically pissing my pants here. So he said, why don't you come on over? We're jamming, you know. We're jamming upstairs. And I said, you know, I got in my car. And I was there in like 30 seconds, it mm -hmm. seemed like anyway. So I'm like, you know, anticipating the biggest moment of my life, you know. And I get up there, I you know, Vinny, this is everybody. Da, 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 da. I'm sitting there and I'm going, come on, think. Pick up the guitar. I'm thinking, Jesus, wow, this is this is way too much. So I, the day ended, and he said, I said, listen, thank you, know, thank you for the time of my life. This is like nothing could ever top this, nothing. So he said, well, once call me, we'll go out for dinner. I'd like to take you out for lunch, dinner, whatever you want to do. I said, oh my God. I said, all right, okay. <laughs> And then um, he said to me, wait, wait, before you go, uh, I got my, do you mind, <laughs> I couldn't believe this is, would you mind taking a picture with me? And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> I said, you mean, you don't mean it that way. I said, I don't, I don't understand. He said, oh, and my, I got my, my friends, my, my musician friends, when they come up here, I got my Polaroid, I set it over there, set the timer, and I always like to have my memories of who comes over. And I'm thinking, my God, this is like, you know, this is a dream, you know, for me. So 
we take a photo on, with with this with this Polaroid, and, and this kind of guy he was, and I did, I didn't deserve this, but he said um, he said, "Do you mind signing it for me?" And I said, "No, no, you don't want you don't want that for me." I said. Would you, would you mind if you and I, could I have a photo with you? I mean, could I take something home that, that shows I wasn't dreaming here, you know? I said, because nobody will believe this, you know? So he said, sure, 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 come on. So he takes another one, and, you know, we got our arm around each other's shoulder, and I said, oh, my, this is, this is too big. So I signed... A, fo uh, a Polaroid to him, and he signed one to me. Wow. And I still have the Polaroid. <laughs> it's one of those, yeah, well, it happened because here here we are right here, you know, right in his, uh, his den or his kitchen or something where he kept his Polaroid. So I, then I decided, well, you know, there's other heroes that I grew up with, Porter, Porter Wagner, um, um, Oh God, uh, Will and Jennings, and these people were so gracious. And it was an instant, hey Vinny, come on over, we're having a barbecue. Kind of a, you know, kind of a, a you know, a pers persona, personality. And that's that's how these people were. And, and, you know, it just, that was, that was my, that was my introduction to, to Nashville. You know, when I first came here, and then some terrible things happened, and I wasn't able to continue on. But you know, with with the friendships that I made, but Ronnie Millsap, another one, another huge, huge talent. And I, he said, "Come on down, and you know, we're, we're recording." And uh, you know, I went down. It was just the way it is here. So, um. You know, getting back to the music scene of Nashville, that's what it's like here. So, but I don't get together with anyone and actually write with them. I do what I do, and, you know, when you get together with other people, it's not that I, I don't want to do it. It's, it's that, you know, I'm so self-contained, and I, I know the road I'm on. So when you write with other people, you know, you share that road with them, and, and a lot of it is is relationships and clubs and cliques, and, you know, I kind of don't belong to any of that, but I'm happy where I am, you know, as far as self-contained writer, guitarist, and I do what I do. Uh, and speaking of writing and recording, what are your favorite guitars you're using at the moment? I have a carbon that I use all the time. It's the carbon double V that they made for me. There's only one they made. And I used to use the Jackson double Vs. There's, there were only two prototypes. But the carbon has a, a very small neck. It's, it's like, a, like a 60 Strat neck. And my hands are small, so, you know, when the neck is too wide, it's too much effort. But the carbon was something I've been playing since since 80, 87. I played it on the All Systems Go Tour and, uh, you know, on that album. And uh, it, it, it remains the most comfortable guitar that I've got that I play to this day. And, um, you know, I've got a Washburn acoustic for, for that kind of work. But it's the carbon that... that you know, is my is my main guitar. And I also heard that you prefer to record with a drum machine over a drummer. Is that a particular reason why? I do, I do. I always, always preferred that. And uh, I've now, you know, I, I've now become, you know, there's no question of it anymore for me. You know, and I used to think, well, there's, there's a... Um, you know, there's a benefit. You got a live, live somebody in there, and you know you got fills, and you got this, and you got that. But when it comes down to it, the feel is not there. There is no mechanic, no mechanical, sexual, you know, relentless, spot-on groove that a drummer can can accomplish. It's just not 
generally possible. And then when you've got either, you know, drummers to me are noise. You know, it's all just all noise. Mm-hmm. And it, it's what drum machines to me are sex. You know, and it, it's just it's it's a it's it's you know a sexual act where a drummer is like. Uh, it's everything but that so I prefer the machine because you know a song can translate better to a drum machine than it can to you know a typical rock drummer there are probably some drummers who who are who who excel at keeping you know emulating a machine but they're very far and few in between and still even no matter how good they are they're never going to capture you know the sexuality of a machine so believe it or not that's you know i i hear songs vinnie vincent invasion demos were cut with the machine and they were they were just how i wish the real record would have been but uh you know, you, you just you hear like tracks with a drummer, and you you think, okay, that's a rock thing. Okay, got it. But boy, when you hear it with the same song with a machine, and you think, God, that it, that is something else that I don't know what it is. I don't know what this is, but you know, I want more of this. So you know how I hear things and how I enjoy it and, and I want to enjoy the stuff that I do and without without that feel in the track without you know a rhythm track that has that, that machine you know sexuality to it it, it, just, it just doesn't translate to me so you know why fight it you know I thought you know why, why am I going to you know, have this two-sided conversation. Well, there's benefits of this, there's benefits of this. Well, you know, mm-mm. no, it goes one way. Either, either this thing feels like the best feel in the world, or you know, you're 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 you're, you're not there. You know, and it's you're just wanting something that just isn't there. And, and I choose to get get what I want right away. Hmm. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's it for me. And uh, it actually has always been it for me. But now drum machines have come so far. You know, the, you, the sounds are enormous. You know, you can get the fills, you know, you, you can program anything. And, you know, you've got the best drummer there ever was, you know, conceivably, you know, right there. So it's not like you're 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 missing out on anything anymore, you know. So it's come a long way sound wise and, and you know, the the drum samples are amazing and there's no way you can actually emulate that. But that's it. Okay. So let's talk about favorites. What was your favorite KISS solo you recorded and your favorite ever solo you've recorded? Favorite KISS solo and favorite what solo? All, all-time Vinny solo. So from any era. Vinny solo, I hated my playing during the KISS years. I have no favorite solo I played. Um, I actually have to listen to Creature's uh, album again. It's barely been a long time since I heard my playing, but I remember, um, I remember at the time... I really didn't like my playing. On Look It Up, I hated my playing on Look It Up. I just hated it. And there were reasons why, but I couldn't listen to that record even today. But the Creatures album, I I think I had played a few pieces on there that weren't bad. But, you know, between that and the Vinnie Vincent Invasion album, you know, myself, you know, dancing pretty fast once I left the band, and uh, uh, the result was Vincent Invasion, but during the Kiss years, you know, it was, uh, maybe it was self-imposed, you know, limitations, but I, I was nowhere near what I wanted to be. And it was frustrating, you know? And I thought, I'm never gonna be the guitarist I wanna be. 
I'm never going to reach it, you know, and doing two albums and I thought, you know, you know, it, it was, it was, you know, we're home frustrated, you know, and uh, it was always that, that, you know, I want this and I can't reach who I am. But once Vinnie Vincent Invasion came, I was dialing in to who I was as a guitarist. I was dialing in. I was going, ah, I think I, think I found myself. And then, uh, then those two years in Vinnie Vincent Invasion, um, they were getting, you know, more focused on who I was then, but I don't think it was until the Guitar Mageddon that I reached the plateau that I said, that's it, you know, there, there. You hear that, Vinny? That's you. That's the you you've been looking for. And uh, I think it comes together pretty, you know, so there's a lot of tonalities that, uh, that were way over most people's heads. But um, I was just listening to a song called Ride the Serpent uh, a couple of months ago when I was assembling, you know, the tracks for Guitar Mageddon. I thought, oh, yeah, that, you caught your, you, you reached that level, that plateau, you know, all of a sudden, there you are. Everything you've been working for as a guitarist was captured in that solo. And that lead, and it was a it was a record where there was a lot of playing. Rob was singing is he he was like the best of the best of the best. So it, you know, I'm anxious to get it out because I think the fans are really going to enjoy this work. Um, but that album, just in general, you know, I, was was the place where I I had found myself and wanted to be there and stay there. So it was just the level I reached, but that was the album. Back in the day, did you ever get to write with Eric Carr at all? Like just you and him together? Eric, oh, Eric, oh, right. You know, great question, great question. Uh, we had a great friendship and he had his, he was a good writer. He wrote some really interesting things. Actually, All Hell's Breaking Loose was Eric's riff. That was Eric's riff. And we always said, God, what a great riff. What kind of a song would that be? So, um, you know, and then, and then the song developed from there. And it was all four of us who made that song really work. But... Eric had some really great songs, and uh, unfortunately, him and I never said, let's sit down and write together, you know, because we were working a lot. And um, my, my writing collaborations were mainly with Gene and with Paul, so unfortunately, I never really had that moment with Eric. Regretfully so today, because uh, he was very musical. This was not just a drummer. Eric had music in him, you know? He had songs in him, so he was a very unusual guy, very talented. We had, we had like, like a just, just, it was the most powerful thing I've ever experienced, because we're, we're talking about my playing, for some reason on record, it never got there, never got there live, but Gene and myself and Eric would jam uh, at, at rehearsals before Paul would get there. And Christ, we were fucking hot, the three of us. It was, it was just, somehow there was, there was just this real focus you know, and, and it was all of a sudden not kiss. It was, hey guys, let's play, you know? And all of a sudden there was nothing that was holding anybody back. And, you know, it was like, you know, unbridled. You know, it's an overused word, but it really was unbridled. I have a lot of tapes that I was gonna be putting on Vinnie Vincent archives that it was just three piece, Gene, me, and Eric, guitar, bass, and drums. So when Gene played bass, 
you know, he has a very electric persona, you know, on base. And he, you know, his, his, he, how he translates that to, you know, uh, you know, his, how can I put it? He's, there's only one person that, that has that, that attack, that, that attitude. It, it's not a musical attitude. It's, it's just a, you know, I'm going to kill you attitude, you know, on bass. And he actually is my favorite bass player because how I rate that is how that affects me when I hear it. So I hear him play and I go, oh, okay, I'm going to play now, you know. Oh, okay, you want you want to do that to me? Here, I'm going to do this to you. So our, our jams were really amazing. And, you know, Eric, Eric was a really astonishing drummer. He, of all the drummers I knew, this was somebody that, that felt so natural to play with, you know, and uh, it, it, was, it was the band I, I had always looked for. Uh, you know, it was a dream band, actually, but, uh, yeah, wow, I don't know, We're, the conversation's kind of going in different ways here, but uh, completely amazing. Overall, just one really special, you know, combination of people. So, so you've, you've also mentioned you've been working on a book. How are you progressing with that? On a book? Uh, book is just getting underway now, and I've got a writer who's done several other big books, big music books, and uh, we're just getting underway. And uh, there's a lot to tell. Um, it's, not, it's not a book of blame, because there's no one to blame, you know. Uh, if there's anybody to blame, it's myself. You know, I'm, I'm the best at making mistakes. So life is a journey. You hope that you can learn from them. Unfortunately, you know, uh, it's hard for me to learn. You know, I keep always making the same mistakes. But, you know, sometimes I feel like oh, I'm getting a little better, you know. Um, but it, it's everything that happened in a in a. In a uh, therapeutic, uh, you know, it's cathartic way to say, hey, this is what happened. You know, it's I'm, I'm, I'm good with it. I can tell you what happened and how it happened and why and what it did to me. And But it's not just the, the 20 years that, that I was gone. It was, we have to go back, you know, to it, the beginning is always... You know, it, it's the segue into, you know, how things, why things happen. Because without knowing the beginning, you can't understand the middle or the end. So uh, it, it covers it covers everything. Things that nobody's been told, nobody I ever wanted to tell. Um, really deep personal things, you know, home life. You know things that that had you know almost destroyed me and uh you know from the rise from from the you know coming out of a grave basically to to rise again but you know it, it's been one hell of a, a life and i still can't figure it out but you know little every day you know you just learn a little bit more and uh you, you know the, the the times I'm in now, I look up the sky, say a prayer, I kiss the fucking ground I walk on, and I said, you know, thank you, God, I'm above ground, and this day is better than any day I've ever known. So, you know, I get to say that every day, no matter how good or bad the day is, because it doesn't really matter, but, you know, you find new appreciation of of life, you know, things that are are suddenly miraculous that were never miraculous before you know it's easy to find clarity when when you can see now you know and you know there's there's, there's no more fear there's no more well I can't be this because I'm that I can't say this because of that oh I'm too uptight to say this because of that so it's you know, everything is suddenly all right. You know? Yeah. I, I, I'm good with this. I'm fine with it. 
am comfortable where I am and I'm comfortable with myself and you know when you walk through the fire and you come out the other side and you're still there you're not disfigured you know you got some scars yeah but you know you look back and you, you walk through this this inferno and you say how the fucking hell did I get through this inferno and I made it nothing can hurt you you know that's how I feel so yeah. it, it all it, it all works now and, and it gives it gives me the clarity that I have suddenly found you know so saying you know God's been good to me and you go well how well I'm here you know I know a lot of people that are not here you know that wish they were so still experiencing this journey still a good thing you know but you know I remember um um, Derek Christopher was a promoter who from Atlanta, mm -hmm. and he, he spent eight months contacting uh, my friend and my attorney to, to who is my friend, you know, say, I want Vinny for, a, for an expo. I said, why? Nobody's going to come and see me. You know, why, why in the world would he want to do this? He's going to still lose money. There's not going to be anyone to come. And he said, I don't know. He keeps emailing me. And he, you know, it was eight months, eight months of emails. Please, I want to book Vinny for an Xbox. I'm saying, no, 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 I don't want to do that. You know, I'm done. I, I just, you know, people change. It's, nothing's the same anymore. You know, I've been through fucking hell. And, you know, I went through a period where I was like anorexic, you know, because I couldn't eat. So I was just playing, you know, wasted down to like, you know, <laughs> you know, one pound, six ounces. And then, you know, when when the torture lifted, I said, oh God, you know, I, want, I can live again. So, you know, and, and so I said, oh, okay, I'm fucking overweight, you know, I just don't want to do it. It's like, okay, well, you know, I, how could you go from anorexic to, you know, <laughs> you know, putting pounds on? I'm, so I'm kind of really relatively very thin frame anyway. So, um, he says, well, come on, just do it, just do it. I says, so eight months passed, and I said, well, let me just hear what he has to say. He was a very sincere guy, you know. And uh, he talked me into it, and he said, I think people want to see you. And I said, I, all right. I said, okay, all right, for good or for bad. <laughs> you know, I said, I'm, I'm fine, I can tell my story. And he talked me into doing it, and I did it. And you know, there were so many people there, and they, see, they, they seemed very interested in what I had to say, and it was just, it was completely overwhelming. So, uh, you know, there was a lot of pain that came out during that, that moment, you know, in that, those days, because it was just like sitting down with a friend over a cup of coffee, and, you know, I would say, look, you know, here's where I'm at, here's all the pain, I need to cry, you know, what about you, you know? <laughs> So they go, all right, I'll cry with you, you know. Okay, I'll laugh with you, whatever. So it was just like a little journey that those the three days of a of a cathartic journey with a, seeming like a bunch of friends that just sat down in the room and were talking to each other. So then it was, well, come on, you know, come on out again, you know, it's going to be fine. And I said, okay, good, I'm going to stay out because, you know, I, I, I like connecting with everybody again, you know. So it really felt so good. It felt so good to, it's not just being back, but it felt good to, to feel loved again, you know? So, you know, whatever that's worth, you know? And uh, I saw Gene, you know, I saw my old friend Gene at his fall thing. And uh, we, had, we had such a good time, you know? And uh, I had a great time. I was late. Everybody saw it. You know, but Gene said, well, Vinny, he left Vinny on stage you know, all by himself. <laughs> and that really wasn't the way it was. I was late because we had gotten caught in the rain driving down there. And uh, we lost about an hour because it was, it was coming down really hard. We had to pull over. But uh, finally got there. He was on stage, and I, I said, "Oh, you know, go, 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 get on stage with him." So we did. We had, you know, we had our two acoustics out, and you know, 
<laughs> telling our little jokes and uh, you know, like it was yesterday again, you know. So it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. We had a ball. That's right. And he gave me one of his vaults to take home. <laughs> I remember saying to him, uh, are the keys in there? I said, you got any keys in there? He goes, he looks at me, it's a rug keys to my house. I said, no, to that kingdom you're always talking about. <laughs> so he looks at me and he started laughing. And I said, all right, I'll, I'll, look at it. I'll try to look at it when I get home. Uh, so I find him, I'll let you know. <laughs> so. Right. So, Vinny, you know what? On that great, wonderful, positive note, we are going to leave it for today. Okay. <laughs> Andrew, thank you so much. I enjoyed this. No problem, Vinny. And I sincerely hope I'll be able to see you uh, this summer. I, I hope so, too. I'll make Keep sure Keep our fingers crossed, there. right? Sorry? I missed that. I said, well, keep our fingers crossed that I'll be able to see you soon this summer. So, Andrew, uh, giving you a big hug, and I'll see you in about four months. I look forward to seeing you in person, Vinny, and I can't wait to shake your hand, and thank you for the message personally. Okay, my friend. Thank you, and uh, love you, and we'll see you soon. Have a great one. Have take, a great day. Take care, Vinny. Talk to you soon, Andrew. Thank you, Bye-bye. Really. Bye.